Good evening. Hello. 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 Sorry. Um, welcome to the brilliant Wanstead Tap. Who hasn't been here before? Bloody hell, loads of people. That's you, Ian, I think. It's got to be you. That's your effect. Well, it's probably me emptied the first... <laughs> I want to say. I don't know what that is. Is there some sort of a aspect of our personal hygiene that the first three benches are empty? You know what I think it is? It's, I think it's your reputation, your background as a poet. Oh. At comedy gigs, you stay away from the front because you might get yes. picked on. <laughs> At poetry gigs, you stay away from the front because you might get spat on as they kind of go into full you, flow. You can get out quicker, yeah. yeah, yeah. So please, uh, we're delighted, yeah. over the moon, honoured to have the amazing Ian Sinclair here with his latest book... <laughs> The Last London. And John Rogers. Oh, the la I will just say that before, we've, been, we've been under a railway arch before. Because John... John <laughs> <laughs> don't take that as it's... John had made a film called London Overground. And it was quite logical to show it in a very hip place under a railway near London Fields. And unfortunately, every time a train went over the top, the soundtrack completely juddered. And it really mattered because there was a, a long sequence that John had cut with the filmmaker Chris Pettit, who's a real um, a London writer and filmmaker. And, and Chris had stayed completely silent and very moody through this whole thing, of how it was cut. And it built up as he was in a graveyard to the point where he was going to make this wonderful speech. And just at then, a train went overhead and the speech came out like a kind of mad stutter with a couple of names of pubs in it and then it was gone. <laughs> Yeah, it, was, it doesn't matter with us talking, because if that happens... No, if that happens, it won't happen, because this train... You know what's ironic? Because um, the, the walk I did here this evening mirrors partly the walk uh, that you take in the book, where you walk along the, the uh, Gospel Oak to Barking line, and I right. walked a little of that with you that day. Yeah. And it brought home the fact that was on November the 9th, 2016, which was, many of you will have that date etched in your minds forever, because it's the date that we found out that Donald Trump had become the President of the United States. And the trains weren't running because they were doing work and they're still not running. <laughs> well, well, the trains, uh, well, what, what happened on that particular day, and I was, as this was a chapter in the book that I didn't intend to, re to write at all, um, but as, as with the project with John, we'd, uh, he repeated a walk I'd done with Andrew Cotting in which we walked right round the whole of the London Overground, the circuit part of it, in a single day. And then again with John, we did it in a single night. And the night one was deeply strange and very mysterious and all kinds of things happened. But I wanted after that, I felt that there were, there were missing bits. And um, first I walked to Croydon to finish that loop because I was walking with uh, the poet Stephen Watts, who's a great figure in East London for many years, haunted the streets. You may have seen him, he had a long sort of aureole of silvery hair, and he was a great friend of uh, W.G. Sebald, and a translator, and had worked with him in Norwich. And I wanted, first of all, to walk with Stephen around the cemeteries and the stretches of Mile End Road and Whitechapel and East London that he had walked when he was guiding Sebald for the material that was used in uh, Austerlitz. So there's a, there's a chapter early in the book when I, I do that with Stephen, and he talked a lot about his relation with Sebald and sort of re, re conjured this figure back into the streets. What was very intriguing, there is, there's a photograph in the, in the book, Austerlitz, of a, of a rucksack, that, a beaten up old rucksack, which you assume is the rucksack that Sebald himself has taken out on the road or that belongs to one of the characters. But when I was with Stephen, I see the same rucksack and I realized it actually belongs to Stephen Watts. And what happened was that Sebald designed the pages of his books in, an, in almost like a, a medieval manuscript. He actually looked at the way the words were going to be and where the holes would be that he needed to photograph. And he found at the last minute he needed a photograph on one page and the perfect thing was Stephen Watts's rucksack. So he jumped in a train from Norwich to London, went round to Toynbee Halls, Toynbee Studios, took a photograph of uh, Stephen's rucksack, and there it is in the book. It was very haunting to be walking alongside this rucksack. And I photographed, and it's now in my book, as you'll see. <laughs> Only now it's got much the worse for wear, even from that. And, um, and, and what needed to be done was then a final walk with Stephen, in which we walked from his home in Shadwell down the railway all the way to Croydon, 
because one of his last great projects, as he and Sebel talked about, was that we're going to walk from their own villages on either side of the Alps and, and sort of meet in the middle. That, that uh, Sebel is coming from the German side and Stephen's family came from the Italian side where they'd been herdsmen and, and had come down to the valleys below and they were going to have this wonderful walk which they'd discussed for a long time. And of course that was not possible when Sebel died and so now Stephen talked and discussed this walk as we walked to Croydon, a sort of much feebler project, but nevertheless echoed the original walk and also fulfilled a section of the ginger line. And once I'd done that, I knew that I had to walk um, the other way as well, out to Barking, because I was told by hip estate agents in Hackney that nobody could afford to come to Leytonstone anymore and there was going to be somewhere, they were all going to go to Barking. I thought, well, that's about it. <laughs> so I would walk from Gospel Oak to Barking. And it was, as John says, that happened on the day that Trump was elected. And it was also when I, I got the news uh, of a great friend of mine who'd been on the road with me a lot in my book dealing days called Martin Stone, who was a, a rock musician and a wonderful book hunter, I had died. And so in a sense what happened was the looming presence of Trump was, was grinning and gurning out of all the TV sets as we passed along the road in every cafe. And sitting alongside me or talking to me was, this, was the ghost of Martin Stone. Uh, and I, I would actually maybe read a little, a little bit of, of those two things because it was a very special, almost sort of historic day it sprung on me by accident. And it's the way with books that something you don't plan becomes very important. And it was the same day that later in the morning I met John quite near here and he, he sort of became the guiding presence across this stretch of country. We might come to that later. I'm striding uphill towards Manor Park and it's coming apart. My interior compass is shot and I've got to reverse, I've got to realign with the future with the railway at Haringey Green Lanes. It's time to get out of the drizzle for a coffee in a Turkish place where the elevated TV has my neck cracking for more and more worse trumpery. The screen glows like a wall heater about to fuse and explode and the apprentice Don is expensively tailored, probably by Russians, to disguise the prime junk food mass He's heavy and he ain't my brother. The man is an obvious plant. The Manchurian candidate is about to become the Manchurian president. He points like Kitchener and he parrots his loud lies over the deserted cafe where the proprietor is engrossed in problems of his own in headlines in a Turkish newspaper about airline massacres and sanctioned repression. I talk to the empty chair that was Martin Stone. We never paused for breath on our runs through Norfolk until the last shop closed in Lowestoft and even then, sucking hard on another cigarette and slapping his pockets for coins, Martin would be blagging his way into some private house, waking up a retired dealer, a widow with exquisite courtesy. They never refused him. He brought excitement into their lives, having previously unrecognized treasures carried away confirmed a certain status on provincial lives promoted by this nocturnal visitation into legend. In the dark, there would be a pit stop, a petrol halt, a cafe, somewhere like this. Beyond books, we exchanged anecdotes and speculations and libels. And now I told the voiceless spectre of Martin, he just couldn't get away, about the discovery I'd made that morning, thinking about benched vagrants and Hawksmoor churches. London, I said, was activated by exchanges between those who are calm enough and wise enough and dead enough to sit without moving and those who tramped ceaselessly margin to margin. The group of Hawksmoor churches in East London, I always felt, with Martin in perpetual motion, questing, finding, selling, living alongside the shell of St. George in the East, were fixed points. They were outside time. They were anchoring their narrative in blocks of fossil-encrusted Portland stone. But I was wrong. My theories at the time of Lud Heat, deriving from E.O. Gordon and Alfred Watkins and John Michel, were about lines of force 
connecting the churches, making patterns, provoking crimes and rituals and visitations within an unregistered sphere of influence. But now I understood in steady rain, on the morning of political madness, tracking an inoperative railway to a place that nobody wants to go, that the walks we are compelled to make are the only story. Walks are autobiography without the author. I remembered how the impression of the obelisk of St. Luke's Old Street stayed with me until I reached Christchurch Spitalfields, a structure displacing its own volume in my reverie of London. There's a slow, cinematic dissolve, moving as I move. Christchurch begins to fade as I pass Martin's house in Cannon Street Road and see the tower of St. George in the east above the Crown and Dolphin pub. St. George was imprinted until I walked through the gates of St. Anne's in Limehouse. This insecure mental picture of a chain of churches and the impulse to shape walks around them produces an occulted fiction of place in the same way that still frames dragged through the teeth of a projector give an illusion of movement and reality. And the final image at the end of our journey is a composite of everything that we have witnessed and absorbed. Stillness and movement are indivisible. Barking is nothing more than the sum of the walk that brings us to its boundary. Martin yawned. Martin disappeared, leaving a faint smell of burning paper. I, th I think that, uh, that passage or those pages could be played back or read to people as a kind of explanation of pretty much most of London writing and London filmmaking in the last 40 years, really, ever since you published White Scapel, Whitechapel Scarlet Tracings, in which Martin Stone is a character, and, and Lud He. And it was fascinating last week to film you talking to Alan Moore, the great comic book writer. I'm sure you've all heard of Alan Moore, V for Vendetta, The Watchmen, Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen, From Hell. And the way that the map that you pretty much described there, that was drawn out by Brian Catlin, that he, when he saw that map, that completely changed his approach to From Hell, but then consequently, do you have any idea then that what you were doing? <laughs> this is all your no, fault. No, I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had no idea whatsoever. Um, the thing was that there was, it was a period when um, you were able to absorb so many eccentric influences from all over. And, and it goes back really to, to a kind of collision for me between um, cinema and poetry, which are my twin obsessives when I was very young and coming to London to be in film school and, and um, beginning to, to do long rambles and wanders without, you know, generally just to find from one cinema to the next or whatever it was. And then later as a, as a gardener realizing that the structures of these churches were enormously powerful and, and were in some ways, if you look from somewhere like the top of Greenwich Hill, they were connected. So, so that London was a, an irrational city but with rational plans put on top of it by various people at various times, generally doomed to fail in their own way but to become part of the story of the city. And I got, I got very intrigued by that. And from those kind of interests emerged a hybrid form of writing that was um, live day-to-day -day reportage on what I was doing as a gardener in an exciting part of London that I was only beginning to discover. And secondly, then having the time to research the churches and the history in places like the Bancroft Road Library, which is sort of more or less gone now, which was a huge resource of, of local history. And the, the librarians were so knowledgeable, you know, you'd open up dusty boxes and show you all this stuff. And it all fused together into, into a kind of writing that could combine wild speculations, uh, satires to do with the awful things that were happening with the, with the way the workers were treated down there and the, and the idea that these jobs would soon disappear. And indeed the landscape itself would disappear because we were, we were treading on the ghosts of the future docklands were, were coming, because ghosts come from both sides, you know. I think there were the ghosts of the things that you find in the past, the scarlet tracings, but there were also ghosts of the future, and they, they met in that landscape. So it was just really being in the right place, right time. It's, it's interesting that it had such a profound influence, because obviously then Peter Ackroyd picked up on what you were writing about in Blood Heat, and then that sparked his change of direction in his career. Obviously, it had a big influence on Alan Moore. And I think it was, the, you know, it was uh, the, the, Mr. the, 
the, the French theory hadn't really made it into the mainstream sort of psyche in this country, this sort of situationist Guy Debord stuff. But when you put it together with Jean-Michel and a kind of very English mm. or sort of Celtic mysticism, suddenly then it had a kind of a, lub a lubricant to ease its passage, didn't it? Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think you, you could look at somewhere from that period, like Compendium Bookshop was in, in Camden Town. And here was a bookshop that you'd go through the door and there were all the um, independent small press publishers all had their wares there. People like Kathy Acker or um, Robin Cook, the Der Derek Raymond, they would be giving readings there. And then moving beyond that, then you'd, you'd hit a tranche of sort of American uh, underground writing, American crime writing, down in the basement, French theory. And next door there was a whole shop with this sort of new age um, mysticism, um, you know, interest in stone circles, all of that, um, John Michel, the measurement. So it all, it all kind of combined, it was all alive, it was all there in one moment in the same way that the um, dialectics of liberation, which was my start as a filmmaker, was, was happening at the Camden Roundhouse, that, that uh, poets were on the same event as Black Power, Stokely Carmichael, Paul, Paul Goodman, who was interested in anarchism, Marcuse, all of these people were corralled into one building with the anti-psychiatrists like R.D. Lang, all arguing furiously with a really animated audience that implanted something into London that then spread out into the bookshops and into that part of the world, as it always does, until it's sort of overwhelmed and run over by um, the sort of capitalist imperative. You know, if something succeeds, it becomes a street market selling leather jackets. And then the, the kind of smaller things are shoved out and it, it spreads out and the kind of folk drifted east and, and, and Hackney then sort of began to pick up the remnants of, of that moment. Um, with the, at the end of the book, it really brings home what you said then. This, I'm not sure if it, I've only got the, the uh, proof, but at the end you date it. You signed Ian Sinclair Hackney, 1975 to 2016. And it, the book really does feel like a tying up of ends a kind of recrossing with the journeys. And the, the world you described there, you know, in terms of that took root in Camden in the late 60s, and then do you see that is, is part of the theme of the last London is that that, is, that has ended now? That is over, that London has finished? Well, I, I think, you know, may, maybe it was an overdramatic title calling it the last London in some ways, because one, one of the questions somebody asked me in some event recently was, um, is, it, is it really losing London? And in a way, it is that. It's perhaps that's more accurate as the title, Losing London. It's as if the London that I'm describing, which was capable of being talked about in different ways at different eras, because I moved through this period of, of being a small press independent publisher to um, publishing kind of large, complex, gothic fictions, dealing with the same, the same areas, the same topics. And that, that had its moment, and then it becomes a sort of documentary um, reportage combined with polemic, combined with satire, combined with all the so-called psychogeography, all of that becomes a whole other thing. And I think we've reached the end now of those methods being able to be brought to bear on the city. You know, I was talking to you before I, we started. I was in the Whitechapel Gallery today, and it was just full of these incredibly slender pamphlet books that described all these cultural things we're talking about in four pages. You could count, here's modernism, here's the beats, here's documentary cinema, here's... And you just take it home, and ah, that's, okay, that's it. And it's like a s series of bullet points. And you know, it, was, it was absolutely the other way around. When, when I was coming to all of these things, there were just huge open portals, and you went through into universes that were, that were there and were exciting, would take years and years and years to get to the end of. And maybe we've, we've reached that point for a certain kind of London. I mean, it's not, it's not the last London, except that when you use something like the last London as a metaphor, it becomes horribly real so quickly. I mean, you think of uh, Grenfell Tower. There's no more kind of apocalyptic image of a, of a kind of London than that, that tower which you drive past on, on J.G. Ballard's fabled Westway, which he writes, uh, you know, a concrete island occurs right where the Grenfell Tower is standing, and the, and the attacks on on the on the bridges, you know, um, these these are images of a sort of a, the end of a cycle. They're, they're final images, and there's a, there's a palpable sense of the city dividing between 
great trenches that are wealthy and empty, unoccupied, and uh, huge amounts of the invisibles who are scattered around the edges, under bushes, under railway bridges, wherever, and the two just not connecting in any way. So it's, it's an atomized city, and I think it's a, a dangerous city, and it's, um, it's going to take different means to describe it and deal with it and write about it. And when I, when I heard you mention that it was called Last London when we were doing the filming for London Overground, I, at the time I just thought, you must just mean that. You can't mean that this is your Last London book, because what happens then? Uh, it's almost like that's unthinkable. But it's also it's quite an alarming thought, really, because when you look at your career of writing about London, you've always had a knack of, of finding the story that it tells uh, tells you about what is happening in London at that time. You know, through when you look at Down River, that perfectly describes that Thatcherite era, the, you know, the Docklands, what was going on around Docklands, with um, lights out for the territory. You know, it's the kind of the decaying end of that 18 years of Tory rule. Uh, London Orbital is that Thatcherite. Sorry, it's the Blair, early years of the Blair, it's the, the big projects and all the rest of it, through to John Prescott's talk of expanding the suburbs with Edge of the Orison and the A13 in Dying on Stones, etc. And, and most recently with London Overground, you really nail what is happening in places like Forest Gate and in Peckham Queens Road, you know, where you've got hedge fund managers opening up yoga studios to present a certain idea of the area so they can capitalise on rising property prices. So when you declare that it's the last London, it's like, oh my God, you know, you've gone to Barking and that's the end. <laughs> well, it, well, it was. <laughs> I mean, Barking was the end. I was like... I was walking with ghosts, I really was that day, and you, you know, you, you, you were part of it. It was almost like I summed up, uh, along, along this route, you know, you, you, pass, you pass the very point where this young uh, black guy was shot and killed that provoked all the, all the London riots. You go right past that spot, and very well aware of that. And then I, as soon as I was into Walthamstow, there were, there, were, there were scenes of people really violent kind of altercations on the street between pe pe people. There was a, a guy demanding money who was following this uh, Muslim woman down and, and she was getting really upset and nervous and with her children he was sort of screaming at her repetitively because he was in some kind of drug fugue. And uh, you know, you got, you got a sense of a city really breaking apart. And then when I got to uh, Barking, finally, and, and you cross some enormous barriers, the last bit, there's this huge kind of road you've got to navigate a way across. And I, I felt quite triumphant, but I did feel it was slightly apocalyptic. It was like the, it was the end of the road. And uh, I was invited to come back the following week. There was going to be a talk about the history of Barking and Barking Abbey and the Elizabethan Barking and all that in an Elizabethan manor house, which I had to find. So I came back to Barking, and uh, it was a rainy, dark evening. And I was really well aware of being out of my knowledge. You know moving around the places I know, you kind of know where things are, and this suddenly you don't. And I tried constantly to get someone to give me a map of Barking, and they thought I was completely mad. No, there were no, you know, most towns you go to, there's some sort of little guide or something, there was nothing, nothing at all. And finally, someone um, came up with a copy of the Telegraph, which is always very good on crime. And it had a, a murder map of Barking. <laughs> and it was this gay uh, serial killer who had <laughs> positioned bodies all around, which was the route I was going to walk. Uh, further than that, I was right, well aware, because I'd seen the CCTV footage of him coming out of the station, just where I was coming out. And that's where he was meeting the people he was sort of dating and was, was su subsequently going to drug and kill. And um, barking became kind of quite alarming in that sense, in that, that there was an old woman, uh, elderly lady was in interviewed, a churchgoer who tidied up the graveyard, and she walked across the graveyard every morning, and every time she was finding a, a sort of folded body at the end, and she was describing it as if it was a sort of the most normal thing, because she'd seen three or something. So it was, I thought, where are we? And uh, of course, I, I, I spent time usual picaresque adventures. I did find this place and then all the gates were locked. And of course I'd arrived a week too early. So, <laughs> you know, that, that was Barking. But Barking was like a fable of the end of London. It was like the thing you describe of seeing different parts of the city um, applicable to the e political eras as new things were tried. The helicopter visions of the Lee Valley, the enclosures, all, the, all those things. We'd gone through all that and it was now somewhere on the far side. 
And it was the, the promises uh, that you've seen in the CGI uh, visions that were plastered up around the, the fences in the, in the Lee Valley and elsewhere, and on building sites, you know, all those things, as, as if they had become real in a weird way, except that the people didn't really matter, because the people on those are photoshopped, they're not actual people. Um, I think we, we mentioned this in the film, but there's in, in Dalston in Square, you know, where this, this pretty horrendous development was put up. It was almost entirely bought, so uh, Bill Perry Davis was telling us in the first days, as investments from Hong Kong and elsewhere, you know, and the people were not going to live there. And, it, and in, in a building that's called, uh, it's had this under offer sign on it now for about two years, there's a, there's a CGI group with a, with a guy that looks like a classic uh, Red Guard Maoist. He's wearing a little cap. And I thought, this is it. This is, this is what they've done. You know, the, the, the Chinese are undermining capitalism by subtly buying all the buildings and leaving them empty and letting the whole thing fall down. And here he is, the computer-generated image. And so we, that became an inspiration for a, a CD of, uh, I've, I've done with Bill Perry Davis, who is a, a jazz man, uh, as well as being a local activist who fights all these battles. And he's recorded some really great tracks with with bits from this book, and uh, it's well, well worth searching that out, just a plug for him. One of the funniest manifestations that I've seen is <coughs> uh, the retail park in Leighton, Leighton Mills, and they built some new flats there, and they were going to have some new retail units on the ground floor. So when they initially built them, whilst they were waiting for people to move in, they put up the, the imagined world they wanted to... So they, they saw them, or they were us to believe was coming there. And it, it was kind of hand-painted signs of craft shops. You know, it was like a bookshop and a music shop and, you know, a vintage shop. And actually now it's finally occupied. It's occupied by Poundland. You know, <laughs> that kind of clash of the idea and the reality. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the beginning of the book, <clears throat> for me, actually, was one of the most sort of, oh, it's sort of striking but most enjoyable because it was the description of your morning walk which, after all these years, you'd never really got written about in that way. But, and, and the fine detail of those kind of circuits, rather than the epic circuits like you know, London Orbital, Edge of the Orison, etc. These small daily circuits and the little observations that you made along the way. Well, I think a lot of those small um, sort of domestic routines are the, are the most threatened because um, the, the way that things have gone, the, the sort of imperatives towards certain kinds of cycling mean, means that the pedestrian spaces have got ever more limited. And so just passing through somewhere as simple as London Fields onto Victoria Park and so on onto the Canal Bank, you just see this, this sort of bizarre manifestations like great tables of fruit being put out with free be breakfast for cyclists, as if all these kind of hobbling people who were actually looking for something to eat one didn't qualify, and the, and the cyclists were going far too fast to stop. So it was a completely mad situation. And, and then on beyond that, on the canal, uh, I mean, I, you know, it was just uh, this guy I've got to know now who, who actually lives on, under the canal bridge, and he chooses to sleep actually right in the cycle track because he thinks nobody will come and dare to, uh, to clear him away because they'd have to step through this racing peloton. So it's as if he decided to live in the sort of the central reservation of a motorway. It's the same kind of principle and, it, and it's work because he's been there for now for some months. And, and people leave him fruit and all sorts of stuff. And you know, you, if you're walking, you can chat, but if you're on a bike, you whiz through. And of course, at that very point, somebody went whizzing straight into the canal and then the rest of the cyclists didn't stop. <laughs> and I, I pulled him out, you know, and he was... And the only, the only thing that uh, w worried him was where was his phone? Because if your phone is gone or messed up, you, you're not there. The phone has become your identity. That's the other thing. I mean, the, the kind of city I'm describing is, is sort of redundant because you see everybody move around. They're, they're wired to another, another reality, a kind of global reality. And it's a very insistent present tense. Present is everything, and these kind of projects depend upon a certain sense of the past. Um, what I thought was quite amusing about the culture we live in now, and and also we'll move on to this in a little bit. Your attitude to cyclists is when that bit was reproduced in the London Review of Books, there were several letters completely questioning that you had witnessed what you'd witnessed, 
as if it was not possible. Did anyone else notice yeah, there that? Were, there were several yeah. more that came and said, it, it is, this happened to me. There's yeah. this guy, one said, that, oh yeah, this is absolutely true. We know a person who, who hangs about and just pushes people into the canal. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a laugh. <laughs> and then the, on, actu the actual person I rescued out of the canal wrote me a letter to say thank you very much. I didn't know who it was, and I'm really, really <laughs> pleased because as far as the other cyclists were concerned, I could have drowned. So all that, yeah, absolutely. It, bec you know, it became a kind of a passion debate. There are a lot of cyclists in uh, Forest Gate, I think. There's, in the past, there's been quite a few here, and they've done quite a few cycling uh, book launches here. I mean, I think we need to have this. I mean, you kind of, you really hate them, don't you? You really hate cyclists. <laughs> and I, and I really that, love that would be hugely hypocritical. No. Say, you know, I used to do a lot of it <laughs> myself along the canal bank. But I mean, it, it, there, was, there was a huge change, you know, in, in the, I was basically, I suppose, cycling to work initially. And then um, at that time, the canal bank was really dominated by fishermen, because they used to spread themselves with huge amounts of kit and dog walkers, and the cyclists had to go along fairly gently and courteously, and every time you came to a bridge, there were sort of sheep hurdles, you had to get off the bike, and, and so that you could never build up a real head of steam. And I, I'm no objection to that, but it's like this, this is a huge sense of entitlement comes with the, with the, with the really sort of uh, bugged out cyclists in the full kit who are going at a ferocious and, and regard anybody else like a lesser life form. I mean, uh, the guy I walked around the um, M25 with, uh, Renshi Bicknell, whose paintings were in the show the other day, he, he was visiting me at the time of this show we put on, and he wanted to do the morning walk, so we're coming through London Fields, and he was, he was got really engrossed in taking sort of painterly images of these crows. So he's doing that, and, he's, and a cyclist comes up, says, watch out, <laughs> as if, how dare you sort of stop in your movement and, and do something as awful as taking a picture of a crow. <laughs> it's, it's quite funny because you mentioned the writer and uh, critic John Day in the book who wrote a wonderful book called uh, Cyclogeography and he posted a copy through my, through my door, as he did with you, I think, yeah, because he's a cycle courier, he knows where everyone lives. Um, yeah, and he, and he said, oh, that's, uh, maybe we could do a walk together, because I was, you know, make a video every week for YouTube, and I thought, oh, that would be, he said, maybe we can make peace between the warring factions, you know, of the cyclist and the, and the walker, and so I said, John, yeah, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, there's a, there is a tension, you know, between the walker and the cyclist, and he went, don't worry, nobody hates cyclists more than other cyclists. <laughs> But he's, he's got all the attitudes of the sort of, uh, of the walker. He's got that kind of consciousness. I mean, he is, and obviously he's a major cyclist, but he's, he's um, a, co a conscientious, a conscious cyclist. It's that kind of, uh, only the unconscious, the, the sort of sense of entitlement, get out of the way cyclists, or the ones that just sort of fly in because they're so addicted. I think those are the only ones I'm alarmed by. And, and the kind of, uh, the Boris political cyclists who just endlessly mount up for photo ops all the time. You know, you're, not, you're not allowed to be, to be a politician unless you, you're on the bike in the, at the garden gate and off you go. But to do you, to be fair, to, to, to resolve the cycle, fair? you do, no. <laughs> no, no, you do go and you do challenge your own assumptions yes. and you do then go out and you, your, your, your quest to, you, you persist with the Boris bike beyond reason, I believe. I mean, most people would have given up oh, at your first, after your first, but you carried on and you got your bike, and you did, so you do kind of bring the two traditions together, I think. No, I, I think I'm, I'm fair, you know, in the sense that when I, when I t persisted with that and I got to do this, and I was cycling through the city on a really snow-filled day, going around the sites where Susan Phillips's music was being played, and the city was deserted. It was um, a sort of a magical epiphany to be able to do it that way. And I, I recorded that in the same way that I was really kind of being fairly satiric and ruthless about the shard. When I actually got to swim in this pool, which is the highest pool in, in Europe, and there's nobody there, and the, the <laughs> helicopters are going round outside the window, and there's this substance that's better than water that you swim in. I don't know what it is. It's, some sort of holy jelly they've imported. <laughs> uh, then I said, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm selling out, you know, I'll, I'll have this. If I could have this every day, I would. It was absolutely brilliant. It was really funny, you told me that story initially from the old Kent Road <laughs> on, a, you know, on a hot day with the traffic thundering past and we were looking up and you think, yeah, I suppose from that angle it's better to be. Um, Hackney really emerges strongly as a character in, in this book, I, f I feel, and, and when you wrote uh, 
Hackney, that Rose Red Empire, you, you said at the, at the time that, that was, you'd been avoiding writing about Hackney for years. And I, I felt, did you feel like Hackney has emerged as a character in your writing now? Yes, I think in a, in a different way. I, I think the, the thing about this one is uh, there was a terrific um, sense of release. If you, if it's, it's like you can't play it. If you say this is the last one, it sort of more or less has to be the last one. And having taken that decision, then I feel slightly stir crazy. I can, you know, I can go off in all sorts of directions. But also, there's that kind of tenderness for the things that aren't going to be talked about again. So there's a sort of a, a glow about objects that are beginning to disappear. And some of the humblest uh, parks and situations take on a really special quality. And it did, to some extent, fixate around certain people, like this character who sits in Haggerston Park all day and never moves, and various others that I've noted along the way and talked to or, or noticed and followed. You know, they, they, all, they all became... Or like people auditioning for something, they wanted to, they wanted to make a testament to me. I felt, you know, I wanted, it was my duty to try and get them down in some way and have these characters in a, in a place that was vanishing. Because quite a few years back, I, I did a book for, for um, my previous publishers, Hamish Hamilton, called City of Disappearances. And, and it was just gigantic. The, set, the s people responded, and the, at that time, a long time ago, they felt whole elements of London were just disappearing fast. And one of them was, uh, was a person that, you know, you've, you've had a lot to do with, Nick Papadimitriou, who I, I didn't know at that point. This was the first sort of contact I'd had with him. And when I mentioned this disappearing London, he, he sent you know, virtually a kind of novel. It was like about 50 pieces, enormous, and they mixed, they mixed reportage with, with kind of wild apocalyptic fictions. And, and he was somebody who wanted to push the permissions. He wanted to insist on the old trackways and the desire lines and the ways of walking around Heathrow in particular, you know, despite everything that was coming up against him. So he gets himself arrested. And, but yet he he's uncovers in the way that you've just been talking about these farms and buildings that have been deserted for development for some long time. People have been expelled under dubious pretenses. And now it's all protected by the sort of police in jeeps who take him away because he's in love with places you're not allowed to be. And I, th I thought putting those kind of characters in, into the book alongside uh, Alan Moore, who you mentioned already, who wrote a, a wonderful piece, Unearthing, about Shooter's Hill, which we visited not too long ago. And he wanted to pay his respects to Steve Moore, who was a comic book writer and a mentor of Alan's and a partner in magic, who just sat on top of this hill for you know, forever, so it seemed, um, on Watling Street, uh, summoning up the ghosts and having himself buried on the last surviving uh, ritual mound, a prehistoric mound that was there. It hadn't been demolished for a housing estate, and we walked past it the other day. So it all, it all feeds in. Those moments are kind of magical, aren't they? When you, we talk about change, we talk about disappearance, but then in the middle of a housing estate in Shooter's Hill, mm. there's a Bronze Age burial mound that a lot of people just go, you see people waddling past with their shopping, their bike, talking away on their phone. And, and I looked it up afterwards, it's never actually been excavated, so they don't actually know who or what is in there. It could be full of grave goods. It's probably some sort of high status. It's got, it's got Steve Moore's ashes now, so it, it's weird. It's like <laughs> as if many thousands of years ago, someone built the memorial to Steve and it had to wait for him to, to die in the tw 21st century to justify this thing that they were, had waiting for him. Um, so, just to go back slightly, it, so it is your last London book? I don't know. <laughs> Depends yeah, I mean, how long I last. Your in the room, so I don't know. Uh, as far as I can see, as far as I can say at the moment, you know, within the structure of things I was trying to do, I had a kind of more or less plan. This, this, this has come to the end of it. This is the end of that. And I'll, I'm not going to stop writing. I'll do some other stuff. And uh, I don't know if at some, some point um, something overwhelms me and I get drawn to do it. If I do it, I'm sure it'll be in a very different way. It's certainly the end of that kind of London book. And, and uh, not, to, not to answer a question, not to ask a question with an answer, but I remember when I interviewed you for London Overground, you had London Overground was published at more or less the same time as a book called Black Apples of Gower, yeah, yeah. which is a very different, very, very different mm. type of book. It was really striking to read them back to back to see the contrast. 
And, and I asked you about that at the time, and you said it was so refreshing doing events for Black Apples because when you write a book about London or when you say anything about London, it's, you said it's the start of an argument. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, obviously, writing writing about Wales in Black Apples of Gower is even worse argument because uh, uh, you know w the Welsh, where I, I grew up, but I left, they, they feel aggrieved that some outsider comes trampling onto their territory, and then uh, other people here think, well, what's he doing writing about that stuff? Where carboniferous limestone cliffs? Do you know about that? Get back and write about Hackney. So you know that doesn't please anybody really except me and. Uh, uh, the reason, one of the reasons for doing it is to be involved with somewhere like Little Toller. Uh, I have always tried to work alongside doing the more mainstream books with independent presses because I've always been a, a, a publisher and a collector and reader of those things. I think they're really important. And Little Toller really believe in how the book looks. And there was no objection from them at all when I wanted color images or paintings reproduced. Whereas if I went to Penguin and said I wanted a couple of color pictures, they'd go, what, you must be mad. You know, that would mean we'd have to sell the book for 53 pounds 70. So you know, I've never had, you know, a and since I think London Orbital, I actually did have some color pictures years ago from Granta, but that, that was it. Um, a lot, a lot of, but the really, one of the things that really struck me reading Black Apples, um, and I, I, I haven't read every single one of your books, actually. There are a couple. You haven't? I've, no, there are a couple I haven't read. I'm try, <laughs> well, try, I'll wait. I'm trying to remember what ones they are. Um, but it really should be, there were elements of your, of, your, of your personal history in there, which I thought, wow, I've never heard you mention those things b before. And do you find, as a, as a, a lot of people classify as a non-fiction writer, uh, you know, the more, your more recent books. Um, whereas you, I've heard you increasingly refer to your books all as fictions. And, and is there a sort of, uh, as well, that something that happens over a period of time of kind of uh, creating a character for yourself? When you, when you write a book, you kind of place yourself in it, maybe? You create a character for you to play in the book? No, I mean, absolutely. The whole, all, all of them are fictions of a sort. And I, I think what was fictional were the fictions. When I was writing Down River or uh, Whitechapel Scarlet Tracings, you know, the, these had absolutely living characters in them. I was manipulating them to a degree. Um, to get the effects I needed for a novel, but basically they were, they were versions of uh, everyday life, extremely exaggerated or compressed. And then um, downriver, the same thing, and that became more gothic and theatrical and exaggerated, but it was all based on what was really happening in, in uh, Docklands at that time, shoved into extreme car cartoon form to make it hit. And then when I'm doing something like Hackney Rosa at Empire, which appears to be completely documentary, it's constructed like, like a novel, and there are episodes in it that are uh, fictional or fabulous because the people I was interviewing didn't want to be in it or uh, you know, didn't want to reveal themselves. They said, you're going to have to make up a new name for me and change the story and make me something else. And so I was doing that. And, and so now I think, you know, in a way, Writers like Sebald, who we've mentioned, or Roberto Bolaño, th those people actually are using a form that's not one or the other. But there's a, there's a kind of a there's an area that allows yourself to go completely either way. And the only thing that matters is the the shape and the texture and the language and the engagement with the or people who are reading it. And, and I think you have that same necessity to create a kind of tension when you're writing apparent non-fiction and when you're writing fiction. And I think those demands to put them into certain sections are, are really rather depressing. And I know, like, I know we've talked about this before, that, that uh, Sabod, for example, that, that caused him sort of issues initially because people mm. were like, no, no, come on, is this a novel or is it non-fiction? Well, well, it's all down to booksellers and um, you know, reps. Well, we, we've got strong sections for travel and unfortunately, it's in the sort of seventh floor in Waterstones, and you get w one copy in a corner. And if you're, you know, a nice novel, you're you're right at the front. But uh, because of London, there's there's been this growth of London sections, which has been quite good news for me. So you get stuck in there, and then it doesn't really matter too much if it's fiction or non-fiction. But otherwise, then then it's rigorously categorised. I mean, I suppose it has to be for for convenience in terms of librarians and booksellers. That's all it is. Really, in terms, when you start to pull the things apart, it doesn't work. 
but I, 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 I imagine whatever you write next, you'll probably be on the move. It'll be ambulatory. What is that relationship between walking and writing? Because it's very well established, isn't well, it? It goes I mean, back a long way. Well, surely, uh, I think writing, writing has to move. It's got to move. I right. mean, this is like what the, uh, Ezra Pound or the, or the Beats or Kerouac or somebody s always says is that the, the, the first principle is that the thing has to move. And that whether that moves because you do it through the way you write and the sentence construction and the ideas or whether it does it because you impose some sort of journey, I don't know. But my, my um, favorite method you know, from the start was always a sort of quest and a journey. I've got the model was this sort of Homeric model of uh, like Ulysses, the Odyssey, is that you set out on a voyage, you have a large quest, you've got pains or guilts or something in the past that you're carrying with you and you go right round and you come back to, to where you started. And the place you come back to is not quite the same, but there it is and it, it's, uh, it locks the story home. And that's ev pretty well everything has had to do that. So the M25 obviously is, uh, is absolutely ideal, it's some sort of complete Homeric voyage. Uh, London Overground, the same thing. Uh, this, this is a little different because because it's the last, there's a sort of ho there's a hole somewhere there. You know, it starts. Uh, the, fir the, l the first chapter was was written last, so I kind of artificially try and lock it together. But it, it's not quite locked together. It's got to leave room for it to move on into new projects. And what is wha what's what's next? Uh, well, uh, one one of the things that happened was the, the end. The end of the book, the last uh, sort of real big section, is this Brexit walk with uh, <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> yes, good fun, good fun. Again, you know, strange timing, quite arbitrary, but it came at the point of the vote. Uh, Andrew Cotting, a filmmaker who I've collaborated with quite a bit, had um, funds to do something about King Harold and the Battle of Hastings. So I said, well, we should walk from Waltham Abbey where he's supposed to be buried, but isn't, and go to Battle Abbey where he's supposed to be buried, but isn't, and um, then go to Hastings where there's a beautiful statue of uh, Harold with his mistress, Edith Swanneck, who's uh, cuddling him on, on, a, on a sort of uh, the dead king and he was staring up at the stars. And this would make a really good journey and we'd uh, take uh, sort of troubadours with us who were singing and playing and move across England and it, yeah, he, he did it, you know, and made a film out of it and then w I, I record all that and uh, it's quite epic and my plan at the end of it was to actually go on in a single day to walk to Canterbury through a day and a night uh, because at the beginning of London Overground, if, if you remember, uh, uh, the, the journey starts, I'm planning to walk to Canterbury but I meet some people who are uh, connected to the overground train and, and I get sort of seduced into going onto the overground system instead and the Canterbury walk was never walked, so I felt it had to be done. But when I came to write it, time was, was actually running out. I, I had, was up against my deadline and secondly, I thought people have just read through this enormous walking chapter. They don't want another walk, so it's all got to happen in about a page. So I'll cheat it. I'll just make it up. And so that, that's fiction. And I never did walk to Canterbury at that point. Uh, it starts off, but it gets to the church of, uh, the, in Hythe, which is called St. Leonard, which is very important in terms of the book. And it's an ossuary, which is an incredibly strange place, full of all the skulls that were originally thought to have come from the field of the Battle of Hastings. They didn't, but I mean, that's what it would. And it was a pilgrim's church, and the people went from there to Canterbury. But they were not English pilgrims. They were, they were pilgrims who were coming from Europe to pay their respect to the shrine of Becket. And this is really kind of important in the terms of the Brexit argument. So the book rounds itself off there. But I felt guilty because I, I, I said I'd written it as a fiction, so then I had to actually do it. So then, subsequently, with Andrew, I actually did walk to Canterbury and from Canterbury back to London, which is where we met up and filmed on Shooter's Hill. So when you've written something, this is again this border. You know, it started off as a, a documentary thing, then it became fiction, and then it went back into being a documentary thing again when we really did it. And so that's, that's the process, and that's, okay, if, you, if it's what's happening next, well, that, that happened next. I wasn't expecting it to. So maybe I'll go around and fill all the holes of things I've cheated in all the other books, that should. <laughs> 
take me the rest of my life. <laughs> should, we have some, should we have some questions now, actually? I mean, I could ask any questions all night. I'm sure you've got better ones. You got any questions? Anybody got any questions? You must have. This is the last London. You might not get another chance. <laughs> you should wait to see what he writes about Forest Gate. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry, what was Yes, it's a great image, you know, it's a, fan yeah. it's a fantastically strange, sort of surreal image. It was. Um, and just the other thing, I, I just wonder, is, is, is Barking the end or is it just another beginning? Yeah, I think it's another beginning, it's another, another staging point because... Uh, I think with Barking you just go in a different route. You yeah. Know, your district line, you go another way. Yeah. District line is quite harmless. Yes. But you can't, you can't go... You can't go on the overground line. Just come Oh yeah, no, I, no, I know. I came back on. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, you didn't waste time on it. No, but I mean, this other one is this, this classically is a, is a non-line. It's, it's a theoretical line. It's just never open, yeah. and it's it's a sort of property speculation because uh, houses along certain sections of that were being bought up by investors ahead of the game, and then the ra railway never came or it hasn't come yet. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the, the the development. I think I urge everyone to go down to Barking Riverside soon, mm. uh, because at the moment, this, the moment's a really great time to catch it. Because I don't know, there might be people in here who work in construction who know why, but they're doing it in patches. There's obviously a logic to that, but what you get are these massive areas of raised earth. Huge, I mean, I've never seen areas of, of cleared earth like that anywhere in London. I mean, as far as the eye can see. And then you get, on the edge of it, a housing block that's got people living in it. And it's, it's astonishing. And I walked, you know, I did that one, you know, when you, if you just walk down the river roading and into Barking through the Abbey, it's interesting, you walk, and you walk through the footprint of the Abbey, out the, and then once you leave the Abbey, and then you go down River Road, which is astonishing. That is one of those last Londons that won't be there. I mean, those places as well, the sort of industrial, what Will Self calls it, in, yeah, well, then also you've got Dagenham Market across the road. I mean, yeah, the old flea market, the old boot fair. And then when I went on a Sunday, there's, on one side of the road, you've got these beautiful visions of, of Barking Riverside, Boris Johnson's area of opportunity that he took around the world showing people Barking, Barking Riverside. <laughs> and, but then you got across the road, you've got Dagenham Market, and then along the road in between, it's boy racers literally having proper races. One of them stands there with a phone, timing them, and they race their cars up and down that road. I thought, it's... Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we, we showed a film last week called Dispossession about the social housing sell off, which the, the latest legislation is the film club is showing in a couple of weeks. Amazing. And there's a whole <laughs> section in that where people in market talk about living in an area that's being described to them as you're living in the new Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite see Barcelona. <laughs> well, let me. When we were doing the overground film, on one of the first days we were walking along, and I, I said to you that you, you cover a lot of protests, you're involved with a lot of community stuff, you see a lot of London, you're blogging all the time. What is optimistic? What do you see that's happening around that makes you feel good? <clears throat> I mean, because I've we've dealt with all these sort of negative aspects. Tell me what's what's up. You've asked me that question a few now, times. Now I'm I asking you publicly. <laughs> yeah, I always, feel, I always put you on the You managed spot to edit it out of the film. Well, I'll tell you what I'm working on at the moment, actually, which is, which is a really great story. And admittedly, it's only one, so you can puncture it. There'll be some bizarre masterpiece. But um, uh, I'm currently making a film with a, with a tenant management organisation in South London, in Bermondsey, who are building uh, a block of flats on their land, in what we call infill, something that you would hear about in dispossession and that's usually a bad thing right in hackney on the north world estate peabody are uh, building infill not demolishing council flats and doing infill and flogging the f uh, flats for a million quid each but also they're getting rid of social housing units in the process in bermondsey right underneath the shard they're building a block of flats on their infill a hundred percent council flats 
right? 100% council flats. It's 100 yards from the Shard. All right? And the thing with it is, and this is the thing I'm really excited about getting the film finished and getting it out there and telling the story is, the thing with it is, it's profitable. So that these rents will be rented out, these flats will be rented out at £110 a week for a two bedroom flat, and they're making money on it. So the idea, the idea, the, the, the lie that people have been fed, and in Wolfram Forest, we've got a great example of it happening on the other, those tower blocks on the other side of Wanstead Flats. Wolfram Forest are telling you are uneconomical to keep as they are, we'll have to build a block of private flats in between on land that we own. It's a lie. You know, and, and what it's been exposed here in Southwark, and already it's been so successful that they're building, they're already starting work on the next block. And so, and what was interesting, I, I interviewed a guy for the film who um, worked for Gordon Brown for a number of years, so he's no socialist. You know, this guy's a kind of hard headed neoliberal, and he works in the city, he's a banker, and he, he was almost a little bit disappointed that in the end, because they came up with the idea for the scheme, they had the land, and um, he, he said, we c the Southwark Council came in and said, we'll give you the capital to build with, which actually wasn't very much money. This is the other thing. The, all the cost of building in London is the land. So if you own the land, it doesn't cost very much. That's why you could build a block of flats. The tenants never leave. They'll be there for 30 years. You never, you never, have, a, you never have any missed rent. So, and he said um, people were uh, very enthusiastic in the city to invest in council flats because it's an absolutely rock-solid investment. So um, it's a completely different model, and it's what Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn spoke at our Labour Party conference the other day. And it's not, it's, the thing with it is, as well, is it's uh, using capitalism to argue against neoliberalism, if you like. You know, you make money with this stuff. And this is the other thing about uh, councils. Our local authorities are making a profit on their social housing stock through council rent. So that's, I'm optimistic about that being, being, and also there's the thing that you mentioned in the book, this really bizarre thing in the book is you mentioned St Anne's Hospital yes. in Haringey and you mentioned me in relation to it and you said his involvement would be premature. Well, I'm actually filming with them on Tuesday. <laughs> that's really mad. And that's really up to, there's a group of residents have got together to, to buy a uh, disused hospital in Haringey and to develop it for the community. So that, those kind of models, are, and actually, you know, with the Bermondsey one as well, this, this is great. When, you know, we hear about consultation, there's consultation, it comes back and the council go, we heard what you were saying, but we've decided to demolish and <laughs> build the flats anyway. Well, what they did when they did the consultation for this block of flats in, in uh, Bermondsey, London Bridge, is uh, they brought the tenants into the consultation and they all sat down and they had a flip chart with a blank piece of paper on it. And the tenants thought, here we go, getting mugged off again. And they went, right, so what do you want? And they went, well, aren't you going to tell us? And they went, no, we have no idea what we're going to build there. Here's some pens, put it up there. It's your scheme. We'll do what you want. And it took people a while. And in the end, what they put up there, and because they already knew who was going to be living in it, so they built according to the need on the estate, those people designed their own flats. And that's what they built. I mean, it's incredible. You come out the back of London Bridge Station, it's there. So if they can do it there, they can do it. They can certainly do it on Wanstead Flats, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, that's what makes me so optimistic. So there you are. You, you, you could go. have said that when I was asked you on the film. I didn't know then. <laughs> <laughs> you came up with something really interesting. Actually, what was really interesting, I remember I gave, because I was working on campaigns there, it was usually the fight back. And uh, I think at the time, I'd recently been involved in the New Era campaign in Hoxton, which had been a victory, and that was, very, that was a good story. And there's lots of other good stories as well of, of, of victories of people campaigning. And you said, oh, so what you mean then is the quality of the opposition? I thought, God, that's true. Oh, I stung a little bit. You were right. But you write about something very interesting in the book about this uh, alternative movement of people building their own huts. Yes, yes, yes. Well, there's a, that one, that came out of the Shard as well, because I went... Um, Bradley Garrett, who, who was one of those people who was, had a fad of um, breaking into construction sites and climbing up to the top of the Shard before it opened, and he's explained to me that you could always do it before the topping out ceremony and there were kind of the, nobody really bothered to protect them and you could just walk in through the front door and run up 50 floors and be sitting on a crane at the top. So they would do that, but I mean, that, what they seem to always do is then take these sort of selfies of themselves, that, which seem to be the big point of it. And they also explored all of the tunnels under London. Anyway, so I wanted him to show me how he got into the Shard, which he did. And then we went for a walk across the city and he pointed... Uh, what looked like a builder's hut to me in, in a building that I knew and he didn't know it was actually a had been a sort of secret state phone tapping operation in the city and it had a very weird concrete in the way that they do there was sort of a, a pointless end bit of the thing and they'd stuck this hut under there 
and they put it up during the London Marathon. They just put on high-vis clothes and came along with bits and pieces of wood and made this hut, and there were people living in it. And you could find that if you actually looked like builders' huts and you put them up around construction sites or around bits, <laughs> nobody bothered you. Uh, and there'd been people who said, oh, would you mind um, signing a few books and leaving them here because they want something to read? I said, okay, I'll leave a few books. And um, people going in there and they slept there. I know Robert McFarlane slept there for a night or two. And, you know, and, and I started to look for them. And then I think I found about 15 that were scattered around. And this again seemed like a wonderful way to do things, that you, instead of actually squatting and occupying when you become visible and you're embattled, you just do what they're doing and just make it look the same. And nobody will notice for a very long time. <laughs> so, so talking of you, two references I want to pick up on there, actually one you said about a secret state phone tapping place. And when I uh, filmed the interview with you and Alan Moore in uh, last week, which was, a story, it's on YouTube, if you go to, she's putting Alan Moore and Sinclair on YouTube, it's brilliant. But something, well, so when you're filming, obviously you're just focusing on, well, focusing a lot of the time, actually. And uh, it's only afterwards, you and Alan have this amazing conversation where you talk about going to MI6 at Vauxhall, fair enough, and the, the spooks walking their dogs outside to check you out. But then you talk about going to an Italian restaurant, which doubled as a MI6 sex club at night. <laughs> well, that was, that was his reading. There, there is... There is this place, yes, yes, it's there, all right. I, I've been u using it a long time before I went there with Alan. It looks like a, a kind of, a, not the sex club bit, there was a parody of an um, Italian restaurant with a sort of very mural and, you know, the Chianti bottles, the whole thing. But when you go in at lunchtime, you have to sign in a kind of weird um, visitor's book and more you can feel you're being photographed and all that, you know, and checked out before you get downstairs. And every, everything looks like the set of a kind of bad spy movie taken from Graham Greene in the 1950s. And they're, so, they're so obviously spooks that maybe they're not. They just like to play at it. But there's nowhere else, there was nowhere else to eat around this area that had MI6 building on that bit. Then it had the Tintagel House, which was a one that was used by various elements of Scotland Yard when they didn't want it to be visible. Then there was Lord Archer's flat. And there was this, this restaurant. So anyway, I went, I went, took Alan there when we were doing this walk across London, and he, he said, um, there's some weird sort of sex dummy in the, in the alcove there. And I kind of looked, oh, there was. And I said, I think this thing, this place is just a, a, a spooks restaurant at lunchtime, and in the evening, they, maybe the same people come back and, you know, <laughs> and so, well, maybe they do, I don't know. I can work out there's recreational, like honey traps. Who knows? Who, who knows? Who knows? But I mean, it was just. It, it, I mean, it was, didn't even look. It would look like an office building, mm. and then you got through. You passed the dorm, and you stood this signing, and you, there was there was this. I stumbled on it completely by accident as the restaurant, so there was nowhere to eat when I was doing all this research you were into this stuff. It turns out. Uh, at the time of lights out for the territory, I was kind of wandering around there, trying to looking into almost every nook and cranny, and I came across this place, <laughs> and I came back, and it was still there. Um, and then I took Alan there, and then there was this other thing with the dogs, because uh, right outside the Terry Farrell MI6, there are kind of little alcoves and things you can sit in. Mm. And I'd been there w at the time of doing Lights Up the Territory with Howard Marks, um, who was, I think, kind of fairly recently out of prison at that point. He, he rolled up an enormous joint, and he's sitting right in front of that building. And I thought, someone is going to come out here. And uh, sure enough, within a few minutes, this ca character with a dog, or sort of he'd never been introduced to, sort of walks right past and looks at him and carries on. So when I was there with Alan, I said, if we're sitting here, you know, I bet you within five minutes, somebody walking a dog is going to come right past us. And sure enough, you know, this character appears with a dog. And Alan said, well, I'm sure they've got a basement of different dogs in there, you know, and they, they'll, they've got a dozen, so it doesn't look like the same one, and they just send people out to walk past you. What's funny about that is uh, I, I did a walk along Thames Path recently from, uh, from Lambeth down to uh, Putney, and uh, I do, to make the videos appear like I'm not on my own filming myself walking around London, I put the camera down and I walk past the camera a few times. And <laughs> which looks really weird when people yeah. see me doing it. They go, what, the, what are you doing? People have actually said to me, what are you doing? Um, I was, two girls walking their dog. I was walking over a railway bridge in uh, Northwood Park. Anyway, that's beside the point. So I do that. So I have these kind of one minute shots of me walking down. And I did it there. And I thought, this would be interesting because if I do this often enough, someone will come out. 
right. and Jack, you can't film here, you know. And I thought, oh, but because I've got the camera over there running, I'll get that moment. That would be really good. Nothing happened. And then I heard you say that, and I went back to the footage, and there's two people walking dogs in that one minute. Oh, there you are. It's completely true. Any more questions? Other back. Other back. Um, I, I don't know, really. Um, uh, the last, the last sort of uh, project, really, I was doing with Mark was the beginning of London Orbital, and we were walking up somewhere in the outer reaches, the Lee Valley, when his phone rang, and at that time there were no mobile phones, and I thought, what's this? And this thing went off. I, I didn't know what it was, and he, s and it was like a conversation. What would you like for supper? And blah blah blah. This, this is the end, you know, this is like the end of civilization as we know it. Because we've got out here, we've escaped, and this thing is tagging us in some way. I thought, oh, so, and it wasn't, that wasn't the reason I stopped working with Mark. But um, it did sort of symbolize this moment that Mark was sort of moving into the technologies of the present moment. And I was, I was being Luddite as ever, and, and seeing this as being kind of quite a sinister thing. But I mean, I believe Mark is um, doing quite a lot of things with the poet Rod Mangum. They've been doing um, texts about sort of landscape and other things. And he's had, had a very nice book published in Liège of the work he's been doing, which has kind of veered as much towards art uh, as, as the reportage photographs which he was taking at the time that I, I worked with him. Some of the people in your books have really become characters in their own right, certainly the minds of your readership. Well, some of them were characters, you know, before I mean, they ever <laughs> came near them. <laughs> they're people, but I mean, they, you know, who's the, uh, that raises the question about a number of other people, actually, I'm curious about. Um, who's the, I can't remember his name, the guy in uh, London Orbital who you describe very graphically because he carries a rucksack full of books, the critic, I can't remember. Kevin Jackson. Kevin Jackson, yeah, and, and he, well, how, did he, how did he react to his depiction in London um, Orbital? Well, well, very well, very, very nicely. He was, uh, he, d he denied the sort of, uh, that he'd sort of completely broken down at the end because there was this terrible last day, you know. I mean, Kevin was somebody who was, it started out, he was, he wanted to write a piece, I, f I forget f f what for, The Independent or The Guardian or something, and I, and could he come and walk? So I said, yeah, no, absolutely, you know, I'd be very happy, you know, join in, come and walk. So he collected him, and he, he'd got, virtually all my books in his rucksack. I said, y y that's going to get a bit heavy, Kevin. And he said, oh, no, 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 we need him. And he also had a kind of big leather coat. So after, after about 20 minutes, I can see he's visibly wilting. And this is, this is getting worse and worse and worse. And so I've, we kind of find a roadside cafe somewhere, and he's, he gets all this stuff out. And he's really happy because we're talking books. And then we load up again, and off we go. And by lunchtime, he's completely wrecked because the weight of this thing and the the shoes he's wearing and all the rest of it. So it's a sort of big session of um, b blisters and all that. But he, he carries on heroically. And then he comes back for, a, for another go later. And is there at the end when we came round into, into uh, Waltham Abbey. Through Epping Forest in the dark with the cars swirling by. And he was, he was completely, you know, shell-shocked ghost by the end. Because I remember sitting in that, there's a pub right by the, churchyard um, and celebrating the sort of finish of this and and Kevin sort of heroically had moved from the role of a reporter who was um, looking at this and trying to describe it and make sense of it to someone who was locked into the total dream of the city and becomes like a kind of a, a fugue you know the, the, the whole experience of going through the night and indeed beginning to connect with uh, John Clare and the asylum there in High Beach and think of the next project. And um, Kevin, Kevin is a very, very prolific writer. He's, you know, he's published lots of books. But I think at that time he used to get a lot of radio, which suited, suited his abilities very well. But that kind of radio seems to have vanished, you know, or, or hived off in other directions, which is a pity. Another disappearance. Any more questions? Well, he's, he's not disappeared. He's still there, but he's just not, mm, not in that too. particular yeah. ambience anymore.
Well, uh, no, I do. I do. I mean, there are some some things. Obviously, I go back to all the time, and I reference them a lot. Like um, William Blake, I've got a book there. I'm, I pick up constantly and look at um, John John Clare's work. I, I I refer back to poets a lot. You know, all the time of, of people closer to my own time. I've I've been very influenced by Charles Olson, the American poet, with his ideas of open field composition, where you it's your business to research everything and then. Um, release it, you know, in, in um, discrete chunks. And uh, the poet uh, Jeremy Prynne in Cambridge has been... I had a very uh, intense um, correspondence with him when I was starting out. And he was so sharp and, and so smart. And his friend, uh, the American poet Ed Dawn, I think those, those people have been constantly important to me and still are. And the ones I've met um, that have been important that I go back to, there's, there's William Burroughs, who's strange and unknowable and very astringent in every way, and um, J.G. Ballard, who was like an extremely generous person, um, but who would never, never talk about his own work at all. He was, he was very interested in everything else, and in roads and highways and the world, but his own work was off limits, so, so we never got to find out anything about that. Uh, and what finally, I would say in terms of London, uh, Michael Moorcock, who's, who's like somebody who's been write, writing since he was 15 or so. He's been through every genre, uh, editing comics to start with, then uh, sword and sorcery novels that were very popular globally, and then writing wonderful London books like Mother London. And he is here at the Whitechapel Gallery on, sun on Saturday at uh, 4.30. He, he and I are having a conversation about London. And he, he's sort of anticipated me into the, into the last London theme because he, he left London and went to live in Texas, of all places, uh, a way back. And seemingly, at that point, sort of it was his last London. And the way he's managed things is to... Um, create a, a time portal that, that within this um, book that he's just done, The Whispering Swarm, there are, there are characters who are using his autobiographical material in the contemporary world, but I'm able to pass through somewhere near Fleet Street that drops them into the world of all of these influences and the things that he's read that are so important to him. So uh, he gets the best of both worlds, which I don't think I could do, but it's a nice, nice idea. So, so I think all of those people have, have, have been important and are important still. You, uh, you mentioned how much you enjoy being at the Northern Stars. I wonder, do you think that number of the kind of oligarchs will get its AC player or is it kind of resistance? <laughs> well, it, it kind of, it, it, ha it has different kinds of people than me, but it, it has a lot of people who uh, respond to it and represent it, particularly in things like film and TV drama, I mean, it, that London is a set. The things that happen in it are always kind of unreal and unlikely, but they're very seductive to filmmakers. Uh, whether someone emerges who actually describes that, well, I don't know. I mean, Ballard obviously has done High Rise w way, way ahead of that, very prophetically uh, setting it where where Docklands would grow up, but writing it years, years before it happened. So I think it would take, take that kind of writer, that kind of order of writer, to really engage with that world. And it would be very different from anything I could do, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who's lining it up. Oh, yes. Can you tell us about the meeting? With W.G. Sable in a, in a lift. Oh, God. Well, it, it was not really a meeting as such. It was, uh, I'd been doing something at the BBC, and I'd read this uh, interview that morning with Sable in The Guardian, I think it was, saying that he, he was only going to do this one interview. That was it. No more. And then so I was at the BBC, and I got into a lift, and he was in the lift with his publicist from Penguin, or whoever it was, and she was saying, well, we've done that interview at 10, we've got the other one at 11.30, and if I could get you across to so-and-so by four, we could... And he was looking shell-shocked, as if he, he really thought there was only going to be one interview, and he looked 
he, he had a look, way of looking incredibly melancholy, but he had a very rich, um, deep, seductive kind of voice that was magic to listen to. And we, we just sort of uh, glanced and nodded, and that was the end of it. And then the lift opened, and he's gone. We went off in different directions. And it was very, uh, well, it was, it was very tragic, that, that, but so out of keeping with the stories that, uh, that are in his books that he dies in a car, because all of, all of his constructions are about either walking or train journeys or somebody waiting in railway hotels. And then these dramatic incidents in his life happened in cars, because he commuted a lot between the university in Norwich and his village in Pouringland. And from Stephen Watts, I heard this amazing story that once, uh, way back in the 80s, when he was driving on that road, he half heard some poem on the radio. It was, it was coming from Radio 3, and reception was very bad. So he's, he's fiddling with his radio to try and get this poem that he can hear properly, and it's Stephen Watts in London. And Stephen Watts is writing a version of a German poem in which he floats above the streets of Whitechapel. And it's, it's an epiphany for Sebald. And in trying to get that, because there's a lot of American basses and all kinds of weird radio sound there, he nearly crashed. He swerved into the other side of the road and just narrowly avoided a crash. So then he met Stephen Watts shortly afterwards when he came to Norwich to get a job with a translation. And they became great friends and, and uh, uh, long-time walking colleagues. And so Stephen had told me that story, and then again it's sort of so uh, strange and shapely and sad that this happens at the end. Uh, again, he has a heart attack and swerves across that same road and is killed. And there is there's a film, you, you, you probably saw it, Patience After Sable, it's called by a guy called Grant G. Ian, it's been a real pleasure and an honour to have you here. Well, thank, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. and this is your, your territory. And, and of course, Ian will be signing copies of The Last London at the back of the room. Grab them whilst they're hot. <laughs>